Hi friends, it's Deanna Williston from Our Blooming Catholic Life, and I'm coming to you with a popular request. How did secular Franciscans go from a full friar-like habit to this little tiny thing we wear around our neck on a pin or on a ring? How did we go down to the towel? Let's start out with the towel part. The tau is actually the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's the last, it's the littlest. You can see how that alone would appeal to St. Francis. But in fact, it comes from scripture in Ezekiel 9.4 and Revelation 7.3. It was the mark of the Lord on the faithful, on their foreheads. Remember that? The fourth Lateran Council, when they got together and they were talking so much about how the cross had been a symbol, it was... It was shameful. It was where criminals, murderers were executed, right? And yet Jesus made the greatest sacrifice at all. He, he became shameful. He became humiliated as a human, right? He became so humble like that. And he redeemed, though, that symbol. It was no longer, the cross was no longer the sign of, of a criminal. It was the sign of great sacrifice and redemption. So the letter itself used to be last, but not anymore. Now it is first. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. So it became such a great symbol for the Fourth Lateran Council. St. Francis was there. It really spoke to his heart, and it became his symbol. Soon he was marking like his letters with letter T. It said he just started drawing them everywhere. He was putting towels on everything, which actually reminds me of St. Kateri and the shrine's North American, first North American martyrs, where they would actually make the, a cross on different trees as they went along. Sorry, I digressed there a little bit. I mean, Francis, even one time he wrote a letter to Brother Leo and he drew a picture of him and he marked him with a towel. What a beautiful sign of both friendship and fatherhood that he thought that Brother Leo was that holy that he went ahead and marked him. Now, on here, You'll notice I also have three knots on here. They are for humility, holiness, and charity. Because the secular Franciscans order, as it stands now with the rule of 1978, includes diocesan priests married and single. So we're not going to take the same vows of poverty right, and chastity that the friars would because some of us are married. And so we went with humility, holiness, and charity. Whew, that's a lot right there, right? So how did we lose the habit? The habit was actually in the rule. Remember, this was our history book by Robert Stewart. I've reviewed this if you want to go check it out. So I've used it as a source um, in making this video. The later exhortation doesn't really talk about clothing. It says, we must not be wise and prudent according to the flesh. Rather, we must be simple, humble, and pure. That sounds a lot like our humility, holiness, and charity, right? Okay, the next rule had a little bit more. Pardon my pronunciation, memoriali propiciti. This one had a great deal on dress, and you'll see why it got updated later. Let the men of this fraternity wear garments of ordinary colorless cloth, the price of which shall not exceed six soldi of Arvina money per yard, unless from this they shall be dispensed from a time because of an evident and necessary cause. The width and length of the cloth should be included in said price. Let them have cloaks and furred outer garments without any opening at the neck, fastened or in one piece, and not buckled as the seculars wear. I wonder what that's about. And with clothed sleeves. Three, let the sisters wear cloaks and tunics of ordinary cloth of the same price. Or at least of the cloak, let them have black or white skirts or dresses or roomy linen robe without plates, whose cost is not more than 12 denarii of Ravina money per yard. According, sorry, four, According to the state of each woman and the local custom, they be, may be dispensed from the price and manner of outer garments. Five, let them not wear silk or colored ribbons or cords, or let the brothers as well as sisters have furs of lambskin only. Six, it is unlawful to have other than leather purses and thongs sewn without silk. Other ornaments let them put away in the judgment of the visitor. Seven, let them not attend shameful entertainments, theaters, or dances, and let them give nothing to actors and prohibit, and prohibit that anything be given by their family. That's all in the same section. I'm not sure what the last one is, is in there for, I, though I guess that you would be exposed to more worldly things if you went to the entertainment. Um, now, what does the next rule, humilitati propicitum, say? 
This was given by Innocent the. Th yes, this was one was by Innocent the Third in 1201. He just says your clothes ought to be neither too elegant nor too shabby, but of a kind that have no irreligious note about them, for neither affected dirtiness nor shabbiness nor exquisite neatness and elegance are suitable for a Christian. And he reminds you, do not love the world, brethren, nor those things which are in the world. So you can see how some of that needed updated. Now, I have found in my research and from your comments on my videos that even within the Catholic tradition, currently, now, um, there are other Catholics who say that they are secular Franciscans, but are not of the secular Franciscan order that I'm of. I follow the rule of 1978. There are whole groups of people following some of these older rules, whether they are following the later exhortation, memoriali propiciti, or humilitati propiciti, I can't say these, or whether they are following the 1800s rule of Leo, or like I am, the Pauline rule of 1978. So there are people following all different rules. They were all approved rules in their day and time. But the one that I would say is currently approved is 1978. So we're not going to go into that legality. We're going to be, remember that? Humility, holiness, and charity. We're just going to discuss what may work for people in some of the history. We're not going to get into that other topic at all. The rule of 1883, we are going to talk about here just why we moved to the rule of 1883. It was actually Pope Leo VIII had a great devotion to Francis, and he was a member of the Third Order Secular. He saw this as a great way to restore Christianity, and he really wanted to promote the Third Order. So he actually wrote an encyclical on it, and he was sure that this was going to work. Um, let see. I am not finding... The encyclical was auspiciat, A-U-S-P-I-C-A-T-O. And he sent it out thinking that this was going to be it. So he sent that, that encyclical one year before he made his rule. And he was just sure that this way of life was going to be the way to restore the church. And he had a lot of penance and a lot of prayer in his. And he was just so sure that it was going to be a restoration of Christian society based on the restoration of Christian culture and intelligence. So he really wanted a revival of Thomistic philosophy in a return to a, a real Christian life that was just steeped in praying unceasingly. And what happened, why we ended up moving away from that rule? Um, because it became, for some, a lot of people went, became very devout in it. And a lot of people, it was like the cool in thing to do. And it became a social society. It was like just the in thing to do, right? And that's the reason we ended up moving to the rule of 1978. Because, and it wasn't that the rule was bad in itself. It was the fraternities had become like social clubs. And that's what they wanted to restore and get away from. And they thought a fresh start is the way to do it. And it's not a completely fresh start. It's not at all. But that's, for some people, it became very devotional, very much, I mean, it, like, like a fraternity, but not, not in the Catholic sense. So they had moved on. Um, and this one, this was the one where it said married women cannot be received without the husband's knowledge. In consent, unless their confessor judges otherwise. The members should wear a small scapular and cord. This was in 1883, remember? Um, and so it, it really took away the clothing requirement. And part of why we, they started moving to that, and in the rule of 1978, why we moved to the towel, was they really wanted people, when you're out doing works of charity and being very pious, they wanted to make it very accessible to the average Catholic, they didn't want people to think, oh, it's something you, you know, the super holy calling that only a few are called to. And that's why they moved away from the habits because it's hard, right? Because the habits can be a great sign and encouragement to people, but also it makes people think that sometimes that it's unattainable. So by going with a more hidden habit, they thought it would be more accessible for people and that they thought the average person really could live this lifestyle. So you can make your arguments totally either way there, whether we should be wearing an outward sign or not. It's such a hard call, right? It is such a hard call. And some people, instead of wearing the, the towel, 
right? Remember the towel? It really is a Franciscan habit that the friars were wearing. If you see them hold their arms out, they're really wearing, the habit really is a towel, but it's just a very in-your-face towel, right? So then they moved to a scapular because, because seculars were in the world and a lot of them were tradesmen and it, so it was hard to wear that big robe and do all your trades. So they moved to like an eight inch by eight inch scapular that was tied around the ro your waist with a rope under your clothing. And that could still be super aw awkward, right? And as they moved on, they moved in the role of the 1883, they moved to the, the modern scapular, what you think is a scapular, but they did keep the rope. The rope was more like this, and you can see it still has our three knots on it, two, three. It's a long sort of rope. This was actually somebody's historical rope. It was passed down to me, and they wore it around their waist, again, under their garments, so nobody even knew they were wearing it. Some orders still kept, even in 1883, because there was, there was this little caveat in the rule. If your fraternity had still been wearing the habit and had been wearing it for at least 100 years, you could keep it. And so a lot of people were still wearing it, um, mainly I think in Europe, for meetings, ceremonies, that sort of thing. And they really clung to it. But as time went on, that disappeared as well. People started to frown on it because, I don't know, again, they thought it was too in your face for people and was making the order not accessible. It made it too cliquish, right? And so a lot of people ended up with just the rope or just the towel. Now the towel symbol that is used here in America by the, those following the rule of 1978, we wear it in America, you don't exactly have to wear that. It's Article 43 of the Constitution and it basically says, see your national statutes, they'll tell you what exactly you wear. So some orders actually wear, some orders, sorry, some nationals, nations actually wear this the con, con <laughs> no, I can't talk at all the conformity which you can see is two hands bearing the stigmata one it does not have any clothing on it that's Jesus and you can see one sort of you can see the line there this is the habited one this is St. Francis and it's in front of a towel it's called the conformity and so some national fraternities actually have you wearing this instead of the towel. Now you'll notice I also have a miraculous medal. This is not a part of my official habit. It's not. I added that myself because that's something that's very important to me. Also the Marian nature of the secular Franciscan order. And you can find that a lot in Father Peter Damien Fellner's work. Sorry, sorry. Father Peter Damien Fellner's work. He talks a lot about the Marian nature of the Franciscan order. I am consecrated to Mary, and so I wear the Miraculous Medal on here. Um, and there's a lot of, like I say, other secular Franciscan groups in our country. Some are Methodist, some are Lutheran. There's a lot of Catholic ones that are not a part of our international group. They may belong, be attached to a certain, uh, some may be attached to Capuchins, to Marian Fathers of the Immaculata. There are a lot of little ones that are attached to religious orders. Ours is not. Ours is independent of religious orders. We're not attached to friars. Like my group actually meets at a friary, but we're not attached to them. We meet at the friary. And so we work with them, not under them. Um, let's see. That's just a reason for a lot of the differences. One of the things I wanted to briefly talk about, uh, uh, bear with me, is... Okay, so why are some of the modern groups follow, that are following the older rules, they've gone back, they've adapted those rules um, the, from the 1200s or the 1800s to be what they consider modern standards. By which I mean, the remember when I read to you the original earlier rules? There were like three of them, right? Really early rules. They actually said like an actual unit of money. Now we're not going to sit here and convert with ancient with medieval Italian money. We're not gonna sit here and convert to modern American money. That's getting a little silly. So they took like those price limits off. Um, we don't normally wear furs in the winter. So they, they updated those. And most of the rules that I've seen from my research, um, which you have all have recommended uh, different sites and all, they say like you should wear solid colors, solid neutral colors. So like your grays, your browns, your blacks, or blue for Mary and um, 
very modest clothing they're asking for, which is very hard to find these days. Um, I can find very few places. One I'm finding skirts at right now is called Christopher in Banks, but I get a decent amount of my clothing then, not, not what I'm wearing now, but from Kosher Casual, which is actually for kosher Jewish women, but they have a lot of good modest clothing out there. Um, and so they're saying also, <laughs> some of them are like, if you want to have it, why don't you do what St. Francis did? Go under a bridge, do a homeless encampment, and trade your clothes with the homeless. I'm not really recommending that. Like the one rule says, it, it, just being dirty for dirty's sake it, is getting a little silly. And in fact, a lot of the clothes that our poor people are wearing nowadays come from mega marts, right? And it's not just cheap, it's cheap. And it's not very modest. A lot of the clothes are so thin, they're see-through. Please don't wear that. They're cut immodestly. Very low necks, very, even high-waisted shirts, right? You've got your crop tops are back. Uh, leggings, please don't wear leggings. Uh, very tight clothing. Even the men's clothing right now is super tight. So we don't need to be wearing that clothing from our local Mega Marts. Um, yes, it is cheap. Yes, is what the poor are wearing because they have no option. If you are a clothing manufacturer, I'm going to challenge you to make some more modest as well as decent clothing for people. Um, so when I donate clothes, I try not to donate clothes from those places. Rather, I would challenge you to do something called a capsule wardrobe. What is a capsule wardrobe? It is when you have a few pieces of clothing that all go together. And it fits very well with those rules, um, both the historical rules and the rules that a lot of uh, people are Franciscans are following right now, where you have solid colors. So for the ladies, you may have, ladies and men, whether you're wearing pants or skirts, ladies, hopefully skirts, men, pants, um, I'd have a few items in denim, and I do. I have a few denim skirts that I wear for doing housework and yard work, you know, my everyday things. And then I have a few nicer ones that I will wear to mass, um, particularly a dark brown and a dark blue is what I normally have. Uh, I'll go with a gray one sometimes in the winter. The gray skirts seem to be thicker, so they're warmer. I don't understand that, but that's the way the world works. So maybe I have five skirts that I really wear. I have others, but really five. And then I ha might have one or two nice dresses that fit me. Again, I have one that's plain and one that has a floral pattern on it. So for men, you could have a couple pairs of jeans and a couple pairs of dress pants that you would have for mass. And then go with solid color tops. Um, and the reason you would do this is you would have, again, some really hardy ones for yard work and housework, everyday wear, and a couple nicer ones for wearing to church. And then you're gonna have some, like I tend to wear sweatshirts around the house and doing yard work. It's kind of funny because it's almost like I'm wearing a habit, but anyway. Um, so for housework and yard work, I tend to wear hooded sweatshirts. And then I have nicer sweaters that I will wear if I'm going out or going to mass. So same thing for men and women, you can have of all kinds, you can have, you know, a couple, have some sweatshirts for housework and yard work, and then some sweaters um, for going out, maybe some, some scarves that you can buy inexpensively because the scarves don't really matter if they're cheap. They're, that's one where you can go. And then you can mix and match. That's where the capsule comes in. All your clothes, you should be able to mix and match. And then you're going to get a million outfits out of like 10 pieces of clothing. So that is a way to go. And you can buy better quality things that are more modest, that are going to last you a long time. And that last you a long time thing is where the inexpensiveness comes in. So you might be making a bigger initial layout to get them, but you're not going to have to constantly replace them. And so you're going to be saving money in the long run. And that's how you're going to keep your, your poverty and humility in it. And I will tell you, no, there is a company out right now. It's called Wool and. It's exactly as it sounds. Wool, W-O-O-L and A-N-D, so wool and, and they have a dress challenge out for women. They make merino wool dresses, and they are challenging you to wear that one dress for 100 days in a row. If you do it and document it, they will send you $100 back. Now, the dresses cost about $100, so you're going to end up getting that dress for free. Also, it's a great thing. Wool is temperature regulating, it is temperature regulating, so you can wear it in the summer and in the winter. And it's a pretty hardy fabric. You buy a solid patterned one, and same thing, you mix it up with some scarves and sweaters. Beautiful, simple. There's your capsule wardrobe, there's your habit. Done. Men, sorry, you're probably going to have to go with like jeans and solid color shirts, guys. Sorry, we don't have that for you yet. But 
Um, if you find a company that has something similar for men, um, let me know and we can add that into the comments below. So I hope this answers all the questions that people had. If not, I mean, it's a big topic. It's spanning 800 years, right? So if I did not answer your question or you have another resource you want me to check out, put it in the comments below. God bless, friends. Bye.